Hey, what's up? Silas here. I'm going to be reading this for this uh, video. It's, I'm too beautiful to be single. Betty Bio talks co-parenting, getting over her relationship with Pastor Kanyari, and finding new love. So right here, that's the person who is too beautiful to be single. Uh, this was something I saw in the Sunday paper, and I'm trying to do this new thing on Sunday where I get the headlines. I get the newspaper and where I am here in Nairobi, Kenya. I got the newspaper and read the headlines. The main story was about... Uhuru Kenyatta, the president, and his top opposition person, uh, top opposition uh, politician, Raila Odinga, shaking hands on the Friday before and coming together. And so far this week, there's been different talks of other opposition people trying to, trying to get their own spot into it. I remember the other opposition leaders, primary leaders, I think there was three other major leaders, they tried to have a meeting with the president and being like, yeah, we need to have a president without Raila Odinga because Ray Lodinga kind of went behind their backs and had this meetings with the president and came to this understanding and they feel left out. But then I'm thinking it's like, it's like somebody gets married and then you go knocking on their door and you're like, you have to take me on a date. You have to take me to this restaurant. You have to buy me this food. You have to buy me these gifts. And then the person's like, I'm already married. I don't need to do this anymore. You could have talked about this <laughs> before, or you could have proposed some of these things before, but at this point now, but anyway, so I'm too beautiful to be single. That's the kind of thing. I think it kind of goes along with this thing too, where she's like, I'm too beautiful to be single. I'm like, no, uh, some cases there's actually reasons. So let's just read this article. I just thought it was going to be kind of interesting to just give you guys some thoughts on um, just how relationships and how some people might think it's a lot different relationship wise in developing countries and developed countries due to things like feminism and other kind of social movements. But my contention is people are people. Different things happen for the same reasons, or the same things happen for different reasons. So there's different kind of um, social and um, cultural demands in Kenya than they wouldn't be in the United States of America. But since we are humans, the same things are going to happen. We're going to react, we have the same biology. And also in the other way, uh, the same things happen for different reasons. Um, the different things happen for the same reasons. We are also humans, so those two things are working together. The different kind of cultures, but cultures are based for the same reasons. Cultures are created for the same reasons, which I think is to reproduce the next generation of that culture. And to do that, you need the biology. Certain biologies develop certain people, certain people develop certain cultures, but these are all human beings and they kind of have the similar things. So let's kind of see where this article goes. I kind of have some idea of how it's going to go, but <laughs> let's just read it and then see how it goes with it. Uh, so there's a bunch of different pictures here. Um, as you can see, I'll try to leave links to this. Uh, I might take photographs of this. But I think there'll also be a digital version of this. With these things, there's normally digital versions of these papers. So um, if this article has a digital version, I'm going to let you guys have access to that. And then you can check it out. But uh, let's start reading. Um, okay, I'm too beautiful to be single. When you meet her, don't ask about Pastor Victor Kanyari. She has moved on and so should you. She's relishing her freedom and reveling in her newfound love by Jacqueline Mahugo. So I don't know who this person is, but uh, pastors, Kenya is a rather um, religious place. Um, very, very Anglican, Angl okay, it was a colony of England and the Anglican church came here. And then now you have a mix of a lot of churches, evangelical type churches that have mixed in with a lot of the tribal and uh, animism type of tribal religions. So you have very devout religious people. You'll see religious things all over the place, like articles like, don't you know God helps you get your jobs? Like this is a regular thing like you'll see in the main newspaper or actually main news channels. Like you have the nightly news spotlighting how much God takes a daily effect in someone's life. So now I don't know if I, th I would want to say, I think I would, I would safely assume that um, I would bet on it that the country in general, more people in Kenya identify themselves as religious than they do in somewhere like the United States of America. But most definitely the separation from religion and public life and general entertainment and things like that is definitely a lot more in the United States of America than it is here in Kenya. Here it is, they talk about it on a regular basis. So there is a chance that she, this pastor Victor Kanyari could actually be a very famous pastor 
in the, in Kenya, and she could also have been famous for having been in that relationship with him, or she might be famous on her own um, on her own rights. But uh, let's check this out. So I spot her in the midst of a laid back troupe, musicians. I later learn, and quite an interesting mix. Some with the turbans on their heads and other pious looking ones trading wisecracks. A jolly bunch. She's dressed down in a pink top and denim jeans, and she cuts quite a picture of radiance and youthfulness. In fact, one would say she looks like a different woman altogether, confident and assured. Not like the deer caught in the headlights as was seen on TV interviews following a 2014 Jiko Pevu expose. She was caught in the center of a media storm surrounding her and then pastor Victor Kanyari, who was allegedly scamming the faithful. So yeah, so that's another thing. Uh, with these churches, there's a lot of scams going on with pretty much everything. Uh, scams happen. I think uh, this is something that developing countries has more. I don't want to say has more because the taxation and things like that is a scam in and of itself. Taxation is theft, by the way. Um, yes, I am one of those people. <laughs> but yeah, so there's, uh, I guess he was caught in the scam, but let's find out if there's more information about that. I'll try to find actual articles about that scam and leave them in the links below if anyone actually checks out those links. Uh, let me know. Do you guys actually check out the links or am I just wasting my time posting those? So, um, I'm here to meet Betty Bayo, the illustrious musician and whose stellar reputation was marred by her purported misdoings of her husband. She has since moved on and is going to be and isn't going to be dragged back into the mess. She tells me in an <laughs> exasperated tone, sorry. Um, and since I want an interview, I'm ready to play the dance. So yeah, she was a musician in her own right, so I guess she had some uh, fame on that. People want, People to, want know. to know, I explain, and I can see her caving, maybe worn down by the hunger journalists wear so well. Okay, the last media interview I will ever do on the matter, she promises, settling into the interview. I, I doubt this will be the last interview, but hey, if she actually sticks to it, more power to her. But why? Victor is still part of your life. Well, he once told me to stop talking about him. He said I should tell anyone who asked me questions about him to call his office line and talk to him directly. That I should talk about my music, not him. But it is not just about him, and I do not want to act like that, act in that role anymore. It's not funny. I get many questions because he does not respond to queries. So I want this role to end in the in this interview. Anybody who wants to know anything about him, kindly ask him. When I go on TV to talk about my music, and people ask about him, I end up in a dilemma, not knowing what to say. I don't want that anymore. So what do you guys think about this, this whole double jeopardy thing? How how much do people know about what their spouse is doing? I mean, in some cases, I would say you look at some relationships and people are just like, oh, who did I marry? What's wrong with this person? And I must admit that there's some cases where I just wonder, how did you actually get to know this person? What kind of questions and things have you actually talked to this person about? Even just your friends, think about it. A lot of people talk about very base level things. So I do imagine there can be some situations where somebody is doing some really questionable things behind their back and they just have no idea because a lot of people seem to be comfortable in getting into relationships in that sense. And in the past, there used to be a situation where your parents used to have the more arranged marriages things where they would be more investigatory into what this other person is doing because that person normally stayed at home a lot longer, so the parents would know what the person was doing, those people were known in the community, there would be research done, who is this person we're letting into the family. So oddly enough, even though people had less knowledge of who the person they were dating were was ahead of time, like the actual people getting into a marriage, they might not have known each other, but it seems like they knew more about what that person was about in general. Like there was more research done to find out is this person does this person have a decent background or is there to just find out not a decent background, but what are they doing? What are they about? So those seem to be less surprises. Now, when you come to the actual relationship, the dynamics within it, of course, if you just meet somebody on the day that you're getting married or a few days where your parents just come home and say, hey, you're marrying this person, there may be more of questions in there, but then it's also that background research. So it's kind of a give and take with that. Um, so yeah, I'm not going to, I'm not going to assume whether this lady uh, knew or not what the pastor Victor Kenyari was doing. 
Okay, <clears throat> moving on. So let's get it out of the way then. What was going through your mind watching the expose on TV? There was a power blackout in my home that day, and I did not watch it. Still haven't. Power blackouts are a regular thing, and no matter your neighborhood, um, it happens everywhere. And that's one thing I think people in uh, developed countries don't really understand, but it's it's a regular experience here in Nairobi, Kenya. Blackouts, brownouts, sometimes entire days, sometimes multiple days in a row. So the worst for me is the repeated ones where it will start, you'll have like five blackouts, five blackouts go out in like an hour. So if you have a computer on, if you have things like that, your arc it starts and goes off, starts, goes off. Sometimes things can go spoiled. Sometimes uh, you can have electronics kind of short out from all this but just a regular annoyance. Um, okay. Not even a teeny weeny bit curious. I doubt she actually asked teeny weeny bit, but hey, you never know. I deserve to save my data bundles for things that entertain me. And this is in the least, this isn't, <laughs> and this is in the least bit not entertaining. That's a very oddly, and this is in the least bit not entertaining. Hmm, anyway. Um, why would I watch it? I already know what was on it because everyone told me about it, and it's a sad story. Were you shocked by the allegations? Not in the least. I had gone through so much with him that I was just indifferent. When you have gone through so much, stretched beyond your limits as a human being, you easily snap. I was not shocked. I was not expecting anything better than that. Okay, so I guess she did know some of the stuff or was already suspicious. And that's kind of one thing I wonder, how much does it take? Um, some people have this whole religious thing. Now, another thing with the religion in Kenya is uh, that's one thing that seems to stick people together longer than they would in the United States of America. I recall growing up in the United States of America and hearing about the divorce rate and thinking like, okay. And I was kind of, with my basic knowledge about um, African relationships that I'd seen with uh, people that I knew in uh, more African or Kenyan because yeah, it was mostly the Kenyan environment growing up with a diplomatic family so I had some access to other types of families from other places and just the little amount of information I was seeing about things and I was thinking okay if it was a different kind of culture you'd have higher divorce rates in developed countries as well and you kind of see that happening now as I think Religion, I don't know if it's just religion, as those kind of things kind of switching by, like, as I said before, I don't think it's necessarily just religion. I think it was more, now it's more the whole being able to choose who you marry is a lot newer thing. And there's not that much of the structure where the family is invested in finding out who this person is. You have a lot of situations where people get married and they've never met each other's parents. Or they don't really know each other's parents that well. So in that kind of case, I think the divorce is a lot higher rate. But... This kind of thing, I thought, there was something about religion as well, with the whole, like, divorce thing being a sin, where some people, that's one thing that I think a lot of religious people really do hang on to a lot stronger than a lot of other aspects of the Christian religions, is that divorce thing. And um, I guess it's because it's more of, when they get married, it's more of a promise to God than it is to the person. So I think they're more willing to let down themselves and let down other human beings with the sins and other things that are considered negative. But when they bring God into the fold, it kind of makes them want to stick longer. And there's also tests found that most of the people who work through relationships, get through like some marriage counseling, actually end up doing better in the future and actually being happy. I guess, I don't know how you actually test this. How do you test the people who get divorced and what do they have to compare it to versus the people who go through the marriage counseling and stay together? I mean, of course, if you go through marriage counseling and stay together, the marriage counseling worked. Hmm. Anyway, <laughs> there's some figures on that to say that if you're considering being getting divorced, go through some marriage counseling first. And I suggest that unless it's... That's what I'm saying. What? What? How far does it have to go? How far do relationships have to go where you're like, okay, now if this person does some really questionable things, I won't be surprised because I've seen all these things. It says... The things they've gone to they've gone to together i've said when you have gone through so much stretched beyond your limits as a human being you easily snap i was not shocked so what's going on with this why was she still with him that long if she could have just left but anyway are you victor kanyari's wife no i am not our marriage has been has never been made official in any way we met in his church and became friends and eventually started dating. 
I did not even really consider myself his wife, and everything happened, and everything happening was a blur. When I was on TV after the story broke, I even wondered what I was doing. I hadn't seen him for the prior three months, and I was living on my own, but everyone assumed I was lying. Okay, now I don't know what's going on with the story. Okay, this story is definitely going a lot <laughs> further off than I thought it, I was going to on the weekend. I thought it was going to be more of just like, uh, like I'm just too beautiful, like kind of more of like a female vanity type of thing. <laughs> I wanted to contrast that with some of the female vanity things that I've seen where someone's like getting into their late 30s, into their early 40s, and like, oh, this 30s and new 40 or 40s and new 20 and things like that. But yeah, I guess there's a lot going on in this situation. You say she wasn't even married, but then why was she considering herself married on this other thing? But yeah, okay, <laughs> moving on. Um, but you had children together and lived together at the same point. You know what? I can't really tell what life with him was like. We were both very busy people. Technically, we lived together for three years, but in reality, that could be just one year. I was always at my mom's place, having ran away from, for one thing or another. When it all blew up, we were living separately, but hadn't decided to end it. Again, now, if you're at the point where you're literally running away from your marital household or from the person that you're with, why do people stay on in those kind of situations? I know I have some issues myself and have some things that I repeat over and over again, and they may actually prevent me from getting into relationships with certain people, but I wonder, hmm, I wonder what about it, what about that situation gets you to add somebody else into your life that is damaging in that way, that you just keep going back to that situation. Okay, they had kids involved in this situation, so I guess that's an additional thing, but really odd situation here. It's getting more and more odd, but I think this is somewhat similar to things that you hear in other places, so this is not something that... It's completely new and something that I haven't heard of before when it comes to relationships. Okay. Did the relationship end completely after the story broke? I'm really curious what the story is now. I guess it was just some kind of a church scheme where people were being built for money, but that, that happens often. Okay. I did not leave him immediately. I didn't feel right for me to leave him in this mess. So I held on a little longer, and I had to forgive him. When I saw he was stable enough, I decided to leave. He had changed and become a better person, but in my heart, nothing would stop me from leaving. Okay, right there. I don't. This is the part I don't get. It's like, yes, I'm going to let you be stable, and then I'm going to pull out this part that helped you get stable. So it's like, yeah, you can be stable, now I'm going to go out, and then you're going to be wobbly again. I, I don't get that, but uh, yeah. I guess it's also... Is it preferential to just leave the person and have them get over everything at the same time? But I don't know how involved she was. Again, the kids sing, because here you go. And you call Pat? Yes, we do. But I haven't seen him for the last two years. But our children, aged two and five, have a good relationship with him. We have an arrangement that works for us. While I have my personal feelings about him and what our relationship was like, his children don't have to know or be affected by that. Now, this is one thing that I am very curious to hear about what you guys think about. This whole situation where you stay together for the kids, or you try to be like, yes, the kids don't should know these aspects of our relationship. First of all, I think children are very, they're very um, observant, and they'll see some of, some of these things. You don't have to tell them directly. They can tell body language. They can tell just by you guys not being together. Like right here, she just said that a simple thing like um, she hasn't seen him in two years. So the, the kids know at some point, especially someone like the five-year-old, would know that, hey, mommy and daddy have been together seeing each other somewhat for X number of years, and then now I never see them together. And then daddy may have other people there, she may have other people there. So I guess it comes to a situation of when do you actually tell them? I do get to the point where you do protect them, I think, for a certain age, but it's good to have to come to a point where you actually have that conversation. This whole idea that somebody can be into their teens and you just don't tell them, I don't think that necessarily works. And at the same point, I don't think it's like, okay, rely on your kids for every single thing because they still are children. But this whole idea of thinking you can keep these things completely away from your children. And it's just a situation like if you, this is my question. If you dislike this person enough to not want to be around them, then why would you want your kids to be around that person? Now, I know there could be situations where 
people can compartmentalize. Somebody can be really good at one thing and then really bad at another thing. Someone can really love one thing and then really not care for another thing. Even if that thing was part of why that thing happened. Like someone can really like playing a sport, the actual activity of going out, but they don't like working out to get that sport, to actually get in shape for that sport. So that kind of thing. They don't like the practice part. But anyway, so I do get this, that. What do you guys think about that? Uh, have you guys gone through that? Have your parents been in a situation like that? Did they keep it away from you? Did it get to a situation where you saw, where you had your parents go through something like this, and then when the divorce happened, were you surprised? Or were you like, oh yeah, I thought saw that coming, or things like that. Or if it happened to you, how have you actually approached this with your children? Um, yeah. If you're willing to share, thanks a lot. If not, um, that's okay as well. Okay, moving on. Are you seeing anyone? Yes, I am, and I'm happy. If it works out or not, I will still be happy. I will still be Betty. I am wise now. I do not cling to relationships. It is only that I am too beautiful to be single. What? Okay, this is the whole thing. This is the whole thing that threw me off. I'm really upset with this article. <laughs> First of all, she's not even single. Uh, okay, so um, saying I'm too beautiful to be single, she just throws that in here. So I guess there is some... Uh, uh, you guys can check it out. Uh, I'll try to see if you guys can get pictures. Um, do you guys think she's too beautiful to be single? Uh, I think she's not, like, unattractive, but... Uh, yeah. So, it, <laughs> okay, I guess that, this is a very, it's a very misleading article title. But I guess it got me to read it anyway, so uh, here we go. So, has your musical career been affected by the drama? People thought that the fiasco would be the end of my career, but my fans never left me. They stood by me throughout the whole ordeal, and I thank them because I emerged stronger. Before the incident, I never used to have... I never used to have... Musicians as friends, but after it after it happened, the music fraternity came together to support me without judging me, and now they are my closest friends. I have been slow to release songs because I have to take care of my child, but I am now in a position to focus more on producing, and I will be releasing music soon. Okay, so uh, this is another thing. I guess just being in an environment, it's kind of good to have people come together and help you out in these situations. I don't really have much to say over this. Take care of my child. Why is she just seeing one child? I can sort of children. But anyway. Um, okay, this said two-year-old. Yeah, sorry. Because uh, one was two and this was two years ago. She didn't see the husband. So I guess she was talking about child. She was talking about the baby themselves. In this situation, somebody who has her apparent wealth will almost 100% have a house girl and probably probably will have a driver in her house, someone to drive her around, will have a house girl to clean the house and keep the house clean, and also have somebody, a nanny, to take care of the kid themselves. I've seen people just even in middle class, upper middle class here, at least have a house girl, somebody that comes in to clean regular basis, if not a live-in person. But someone like her would probably have a live-in for all three of those people, but when it comes to the actual baby, she may feel like, okay, I can actually take more control of actually taking care of them. And there actually is a push in Kenya to make more parents have like the breastfeeding, because I think you're supposed to breastfeed for at least six months. I think the first six months, 100% is supposed to be just breast milk. It's advised to do it for up to 18 months, but up to 18 months, I think, I don't think it's only breast milk, but you can have like water and things like that. But the first six months, I know it's supposed to be only breastfeeding. So maybe I'm hoping she actually did that because it's good for the kid. And uh, that's kind of cool if she, that's what she was doing. And she has the time to actually not have to be into the music industry and doing that. So that's just some thoughts on that. Um, okay. What did this whole fiasco teach you? Today, I don't live in regrets. The information and the experience that I have, I have can help somebody else. Sometimes you go through something for the sake of others. I thank God. I did not learn my mistake when I was old. Some people realize that they made mistake when they're 60. Can you imagine realizing that you have been living with the wrong person for the last 40 years? Okay, not, like I, again, don't know how old she is. So 60, 40 years, um, I don't know. I don't know how old this person is. Can I find it somewhere? Anyway, um, what is your future? I am in the throes of starting some businesses. I will continue working on my music and going back to school to finish my psychology degree. Uh, I'm guessing she's probably in her 20s then, if she's saying going back to school to finish her psychology degree. She looks older than 20, although am I just not good at telling age? 
Anyway. And these different pictures. Like right there, she doesn't look like she's in her 20s. But then this photo right here, I don't know. Anyway. <laughs> Parting shot. I'll be happy. I'll be happy mother and a happy girl this year. Watch me. So that's good. Um, but a single parent situation. I don't really know how single parents are. I think there's not that many single parents in Kenya in my experience. At least definitely not anywhere as close as it is in somewhere like the African American community, the Black community in the United States of America. I don't know if the Black community in Europe and things like that also has a high rate of um, single parenthood, single motherhood. But in Kenya, it's definitely not that high. And again, this is part, I think, of the social situation where there's no welfare state for you to rely on. So most women are a lot more careful on who they actually have intercourse with or will take birth control or use condoms or take morning after pills to ensure that they don't actually get pregnant. Whereas in the United States of America, I think the knowledge that there is the welfare state and there is that way ability to get the parent, get the father and have them be a um, be compelled to pay child support, that kind of makes them think like, oh yeah, this is actually something I can do. If that doesn't work, the state will give me money. So it raises a chance. I mean, if you fund something, you're going to get more of it. And the welfare state is funding single parenthood, mostly because that's a large number of people who are on it, are on our single parents. So it gets that situation where you're funding that and you're going to get more of that, yet here you don't have it. And I think it's also more of a taboo. But now I don't know how it is when you get to the situation where you are a single parent. But with somebody of her wealth, her access to finances, I don't think it will be taken as negatively as it would be if it was just a regular person with um, kids already. But yeah. Okay, bios minutiae. So this is something about her, I think. Maybe they're going to tell us the age here. Yes, here we go. Okay, she was born in Banana Kiambu, but grew up in Olkalo. Olkaloa, 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 man, I need to get better at these names. Do I need to get better at these? Maybe not. But anyway, Olkaloa in Rift Valley. She was the last born of eight children. This is another thing I want to say. Uh, you have this situation where the previous generation already in Africa, in African countries, at least here in Kenya in my experience, we come from generations, like my generation, I'm in my 30s, in my mid-30s right now, my generation and below, people are not having these eight, this eight, this seven to ten kid families. Yet our parents' generation, they mostly come from families that were like that. Now, some of them in our parents' generation still also had those big families, but it's definitely ending in the people who have moved to the city. And this is what I, I've said a lot in a lot of places. A lot of people are thinking like, oh, you have this migration of people from developed countries into the developed world. And they're and having a lot more kids, or Africa is having many more kids, like the rate of reproduction is a lot higher than the West. But I think that's going to level out. It's not going to continue being like every generation of successive Africans is going to have eight kids. So when you have these projections of going to say like, yes, the African population is going to double in the next 40 years. I don't think that's quite right because a lot of people are moving to cities, more urban areas. A lot of situations, um, the child mortality, mortality rate is higher, I mean, is lower in these places, even in the rural areas. You get into a situation where kids are getting more access to resources, to education, to the ability to, prevent, to provide resources for their parents when their parents get older. Because you don't have the welfare state again, you don't have social security like that, so you still have the situation where parents kind of rely on their kids in a way to support them when they get older. So you have that kind of situation where the life is changing and you have a situation where you're not going to have that many kids. Like right here, she says, last of eight children, I doubt she's going to build up to eight kids herself. But anyway, growing up in poverty, our greatest struggle was getting food. We would walk 10 kilometers to school and back and my brother and, and, my brother and I would sneak into people's farms to eat fruits. So yeah, this is... Uh, some of these people talk about how in the United States of America, I remember seeing some things in the news and somebody was like, oh, I used to have to walk five kilometers in the snow to school. People were like, oh, yeah, whatever, whatever. Here, like, you still have that. You still have people who are actual in politics, politicians, parents of people who are doing really big things, people who are very, who have become celebrities and very high positions in society. That did grow up in just abject poverty. That's still a regular thing where you have people who didn't have new clothes. I think the situation is sharing this with my parents where 
they were talking about how they didn't really have new clothes until they were like eight to nine or something. New shoes, walking around barefoot, actually walking kilometers to school. So there is something, I think, this goes back to the things where I'm talking about. People need to look at Africa in a different sense and understand that some things are, if you're trying to compare how people were living in your country, if you're in the West, if you're in the United States of America, some things about some of the Africans and some of the people you see in developing countries need to be looked at not a generation ago, not in your lifetime, but they need to be looked at like generations ago. They need to be looked at like how was life in your area in the 1900s? Not 1900s, but in like, I keep mixing up the 1900s. Is 1900 like the 1900s, like 19... Did they start in 1901 or did it start in 1801? <laughs> I think it should be 1901, but it's called the 1900s. Could be wrong. But um, so I'm saying if something in the United States of America, you have to look at what was happening before like the Great Depression. The Great Depression ages when people were still living in one house and child mortality rate was very high. People were living in such... In such conditions that you can't even really imagine those conditions going on in the United States of America for your known lifetime. So it's kind of something to kind of think of when you think of some of these people. Like, I don't know, are there any celebrities in the United States of America, musicians who were in that kind of situation? And I think that could explain some of the types of corruption that you see, some of the types of wasted that you see, because people are just familiar with something that they just had no access to before. And yeah, I don't know. It's a developing country. It's a developing situation. Okay, house help days and generous employer. I went to four high schools because of lack of fees. I eventually gave up and decided to be a house help. When my employer found out that I had dropped out of school, he enrolled me in Riara School for my last year, saving my education, which had almost gone off course. So right here is what I was talking about, the house help situation. A lot of people do get in the situation where that's the job that they have to have. And I don't want to call it indentured servitude. The way it normally works is you get somebody into your house and then they help. You have the live-in situations and you have some that actually come into the house on a daily basis or on a set basis, set schedule throughout the week. And you pay them normally. They normally paid, um, they normally get paid up to as low as even like $100, between $50 to $100 in some cases a week. Although, if they're living, they're being supplied for the food, their shelter, their electricity, all those needs. In some cases, if they have families, you have situations where someone would be like, yes, you can bring in your children to the house, but it's not normally you can bring in the husband as well. The husband will normally live in the slums or in wherever area the husband lives. Sometimes you'll have a situation where they'll have their kids back in the rural areas because it's cheaper, they'll send money back there. Or you have a situation, a few situations I've heard where you'll have the husband actually be like the driver of the house or the gardener, and then you can have the wife being the house help, helps with cleaning and things like that. Then you can have the kids there at the, at the house too. That's in the minority of situations, but that's a common thing that you find here in, um, think middle class, upper middle class families, as I said. I don't know if it's necessarily the same across the board in, in lower middle class and lower, but yeah, that's just something that I was observing. But even if you have the lower middle class and lower situations, when you have guests coming over, you have such situations, it's rather simple or it's rather common to get somebody to come and help because you have people just looking to just get any little money they can get anywhere that they can. Getting into music. My mother encouraged me to get into choir and people would compliment my voice, but I never thought anything of it. It was a madman, it was a madman who made me decide to record. I was walking on the road and out of the blue, this madman walks up to me and threatens me, saying if he did not produce an album the next year, if I did not produce an album the next year, he would beat me up. I took this as a sign from God. As I was saying, <laughs> people, people, people like the God here. Um... I raised money and recorded my first album, which was a roaring success. I was 21. So this is the only time she's actually mentioned her age. So I know she's over 21 and under uh, 60 because she said, imagine finding out when you're 60 and being with a person for 40 years. And I'm assuming, I'm, I'm assuming she's 30 at most. But anyway, so <laughs> that's the story about Betsy Bio. And... um. 
Yeah, I don't know. That that went to that went to a different place. I did not expect it to go here. I thought it was going to be uh, more just about female vanity, but I think that's just uh, that's more into that's 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 a patriarchal <laughs> assumption that I made that I apologize for. But I hope you enjoyed that. I don't know. Um, I thought it was okay. I, I'm uh, yeah. I thought I touched on a few different things, but that's just mm, that's just a sign of one of the articles you can read. And this is like the Sunday paper. The Sunday Magazine. So you have these kind of inserts in the magazine that's more like a lifestyle type things. Uh, the next article is on parenting, fatherhood 101, scamming of dads of Don Home. Um, what's this story about? Overcame temptations. I was a coward. I didn't think had had the guts. Plus, I have the conscience. It bugs me crazy. So you have these things kind of expanding. They're talking about this. Um, bored to death playing you playing your wife. I too want to be recognized for something other than having a clean house and happy children. So you have that right there, bored to death playing your wife. Um, so this is the kind of situation where women are like, okay, I want to do more than just be a wife. Uh, I don't think just being a wife is a bad thing. At least what do you define as being a wife? If you're taking care of the household chores, if you're doing things like that, raising children, I guess it can be somewhat less fulfilling than some things, at least some people think. But again, when it comes to relationships, I think the main thing with marriage is to have kids and to raise kids. Uh, another article, Terror in the Skies. So yeah, this is just a kind of a selection of things that happen here. A nice illustration there, Man of the Death Wish. Um, stem cell therapy will help my baby lead a normal life. So you still have that coming here as well. That's an interesting article, what I believe. <laughs> While I'm holding these things, this is a new kind of thing I'm trying here. But anyway, uh, what I believe, some choose their faith, others are born into it. What do you believe in? Three people share the reasons they subscribe to faith. Uh, this might be an interesting one to go over to as well. But um, yeah, let me know what you guys think about this. If it's just this whole like article reading thing, maybe it might be better for me to actually read the articles ahead of time so I can actually have a better idea of what I'll be presenting. But um, yeah, so that's this magazine. There's some other articles here. I think I'll actually read one of these articles. But I just thought it was kind of interesting to kind of go through that and kind of see what's uh, being talked about. As you can see right here, this one is about depression. Depression, spot the signs and save a life. And there's this thing I've been talking about how I think uh, depression and things like that seem to be higher occurrence in developed countries than developing ones. And that's, I think, mostly because of the, I don't want to say unnatural things that we deal with, but the extra mental stresses that you have living in a more civilized place. Whereas if you're just living more closer to the land, you're just a farmer and things, maybe just a farmer. Just a farmer sounds like very, um, I don't know. Um, I don't know, Maslow's hierarchy of needs. But I think there's this kind of situation where the more things you have, the more you can miss, the more things that you can worry about. If you have very little, then you have very few things to worry about. You might have stress a lot, a lot of stress and just figuring how I'm going to eat the next day. But it's more of a known factor. Whereas if you're living in a civilized country and you have all these other things to deal with, these other stresses in your life, these other people to compare your lifestyle to and be like, okay, I can lose all this much and plummet all to this lower level, then you can find yourself more depressed with things that some other people may actually find to be a joy to have. And that goes back to this whole thing where I'm also wondering with people are saying, okay, uh, this article in here where it's like, I'm bored of being a housewife. People might, I think you see a lot of situations where females in general in the West are like, oh, let's join the job market, let's get out there and be like men, and then they're getting out there and like, okay, this is not all it's cracked up to be. You find depression levels are going high. The I think you're soon going to see the gap of people's mortality, because I think women on average live five years longer than males in the West, I think even in developing countries. But that's going to start shrinking when you have more women in the workforce, more women living like men. Um, yeah, so I thought it was just kind of interesting to see that there is actually an article here about depression here in um, the United... I mean, sorry, depression here in Kenya, because you have this thing where I think someone is talking about how in the black community, I saw this thing in the black community, depression is not really discussed as much as it is in the white country. So that's another thing I'm wondering. Is it more that depression doesn't happen as much here, or is it not diagnosed as much as it is in the United States of America? But yeah, so that's it for now. Like, share, and subscribe.
Um, links below to the merchandise store. I'm going to read this separate article on religion because I think that's a good point. And there's one title here, Men are born with a disease in their hearts and I shouldn't provoke it. It's a short one. I'm going to read that. It's going to be a separate video. But yeah, goodbye.